Thank you, Peria. Uh, very sorry for the long title, making you have to read all that. But at least it didn't have uh, poor information in the title. Uh, so uh, welcome to the, to the hardy few that have survived another ASMS. Um, and this morning I want to talk about something that we all uh, know and hate, and that is uh, noise in our metabolomics data. Uh, it's very easy, uh, because of the um, wide variety of sources of noise that can creep into our studies, it's very easy to observe differences in our studies. But it's a whole other thing to observe differences that have biological relevance um, for, the, for the biology that we're trying to study. So before we get into all of that, what I'd really like to do is to start with uh, going over um, metabolomics in drug discovery, just giving a brief overview. I guess about seven or eight years ago, uh, when this first started to come into the pharmaceutical industry, we all thought we'd be able to get away with profiling some biofluids, m getting some pattern recognition going, and using that to determine a good outcome from a bad outcome. But uh, I haven't yet met a biologist or a toxicologist would actually drive decisions in their program based on a pattern alone. And uh, that's understandably so. What they want to know is what's causing the change. They want to tie that back to the biology under study. And the next thing they want to know is how much is there. And that usually means not just a, a relative amount, but an absolute quantitation. So I think under, the, um, under this kind of paradigm where we do identification, and quantification of endogenous markers, metabolomics has been very successful in drug discovery. It's been used for compound selection. Uh, it's been used for identif uh, identifying uh, markers and providing mechanistic insights um, in, in terms of the mode of action of drugs. And of course, this all gives us an early uh, evaluation of potential clinical markers. Now, in metabolomics, there's basically two modes of uh, analysis. There's the targeted mode and the untargeted. The targeted analysis is a very streamlined process. Uh, the only problem with that is that you only find what you're looking for. And so anything that you haven't been able to predict, you're going to miss. In contrast, the untargeted approach, the comprehensive analysis, uh, is great for when you don't know what to expect and if you need to do uh, hypothesis generation. However, the amount of information that you get from these studies is sometimes quite overwhelming, and it becomes quite a challenge. And ideally, we'd like to actually do both of these uh, together. But traditionally, I think because of limitations in mass spec technology, these have done, been done in two separate processes on different instrument platforms. But I think today, the technology uh, with LCMS has progressed to the point where we can actually do both of these types of analysis on the same platform without compromise. So if we take a quick look at the sources of noise in our metabolomic study, there are many. I'm going to concentrate on these top three, the instrument, chemical uh, noise, and biological noise. Now, on the instrument side, uh, we obviously need the system that's uh, uh, got good mass and retention time stability. We need a, a robust response, something that isn't going to degrade over time. And we also need sufficient resolution to pull our compounds of interest away from each other and also uh, other um, chemical contamination. All of our systems are going to have chemical uh, background. Um, this comes from columns and solvents. And we need to have sophisticated uh, data processing techniques that will take care of that. So for example, even setting a simple threshold can add noise to your data, because no matter where you set the threshold, there's always going to be compounds that are on the border. And then in some samples, they'll be above the detection limits. In others, they'll be below. And then that causes uh, noise in the detection. So we need some kind of way to handle this kind of thing. And then in terms of biological noise, there's really not much we can do about that except for try and understand it and not be fooled by it. So for example, we don't want to uh, be thinking that a marker of stress or starving is actually related to our, our drug-induced um, metabolism changes. So obviously, with all these um, sources of uh, variation in our studies, the one thing that we don't want to have uh, be a major source of variation is either our mass spec detection or our analytical method in, in, in itself. And so 
Uh, one of the, the data I'm going to talk about today has actually been obtained on a new mass spectrometer. This is the QExactive, which is a benchtop quadrupole orbitrap instrument. As the name suggests, it's built on the Exactive benchtop orbitrap uh, system, uh, with the main difference that it now has a, uh, a quadrupole collision cell, and that, uh, sorry, a quadrupole mass filter, and combine that with a, a collision cell, gives you triple quad like MSMS spectra but with, the, uh, with high resolution and accurate mass detection in the orbitrap. This device also has a much greater scan speed. There have been several things that have been built into this uh, in order to achieve that. We have a brighter source. Uh, we have some intelligent processing of the ion beam, so the instrument's always doing something. And we also have advanced signal processing on the Orbitrap side, which has actually given us a factor of two increase in resolution. And that resolution can then be traded for time. Just to give an idea of how fast the system will uh, perform, here we're doing some data-dependent experiments where we're actually running one full scan, survey scan, at 70,000 resolution, and then 10 MSMS scans in a data-dependent sense in one second. Another nice feature is this ability to do apex-triggered MSMS. And what that allows us to do is to have the instrument decide when the apex of the peak is coming up we take our MSMS spectra at that point in order to get the best quality data that we can. And as you can see, you get very nice, rich MSMS spectra with the kind of accuracies that you expect from an Orbitrap uh, instrument, uh, even um, on MSMS data with external calibration. Now, we had two choices, or we had a few choices for how we run our metabolomics setting. And uh, we decided to go with a, a resolution setting of 70,000 because even at that setting, even across these one second wide peaks, we still had plenty of scans in order to uh, do good quantitation. Now, the reason that we went with the 70,000 is not only because we can actually um, have better chance of pulling our analytes of interest away from any kind of chemical interference or, or each other, was actually for structural elucidation sense as well. Because at this kind of resolution, we can absolutely determine whether a compound uh, contains sulfur or not. Because at this resolution, we can actually resolve the 2C13 uh, isotope from the sulfur 34 isotope. And if we had run at 35,000 resolution, that was, uh, that was not possible. Um, and actually, if you see the overlay of the theoretical with the actual measured, we get an almost perfect fit. And of course, we need the system to be uh, stable. We don't want any variation coming in from that either. And so here we actually show some, some data from an overnight run. Um, this is um, rat plasma. Uh, this is our internal standard D5 hyperic acid in the rat plasma. And as you can see, we've maintained excellent mass accuracy uh, throughout these runs during the night. In fact, this last measurement uh, was done 65 hours after the instrument was last calibrated. So it maintains um, excellent accuracy on both the M plus H and even on the, uh, the isotopes over an extended period of time. Of course, the instrument also needs to be sensitive. And so here we show the, an example of, of uh, uh, testosterone in serum, uh, quantitated down to 10 picograms per mil. That's uh, on the order of uh, most of the uh, uh, high-end triple quads on the market today. And so I think this is... Uh, uh, a great device for being able to do the, uh, the qualitative and the quantitative uh, aspects of what we need to do in any kind of metabolomic study. Now, having established that we've got uh, some solid analytical platform to, uh, to go from, and we move into uh, how we're going to handle the, the kind of chemical noise in our data and the data processing that we need to provide. So if we take a look at any given uh, LCMS data set, we have a ton of information uh, but much of the data, data is uh, irrelevant, much of it is redundant, but the good news is, is that the high fidelity Orbitrap data that we obtain from the instrument allows us for more precise processing, and we, need to be, we can be a lot less fuzzy in our logic when we, when we process the data. We get rid of the irrelevant information by uh, doing a simple background subtraction. We want to get rid of anything that's not related to our sample. And as you can see uh, from, from this graphic, we're able to reduce the, the noise uh, from kind of chemical uh, contamination from columns and solvent quite effectively. 
and we actually get rid of about 98% of the lower level signals in our data, leaving just data from our sample behind. And this is what I mean by redundancy. We have a single compound here, uh, hippuric acid, which give rise, gives rise to several uh, signals in the instrument. And some of them, uh, as you'd expect, others a little bit more exotic. Um, but we need to know what these are and um, what they're associated with uh, in terms of being able to catalog the components from our studies. Um, but why do we really care? Because um, if we're doing a PCA analyses, these should all group together when we, when we do the analysis, right? Well, the problem is, is that these adducts um, actually are very sensitive to the chemical environment at the time of ionization. So these are actually much more susceptible to ion suppression effects than the M plus H ion. And so the error in these measurements is different from the error in the M plus H measurement. And this is illustrated here when we're looking at um, the uh, M plus H signal. We get a very tight response. If we look at the um, adapt information, um, we're actually seeing a much larger error on those measurements, much more variable. Now, this isn't just a, uh, an intensity effect, because if we look at other components in the sample at the same level, uh, we can measure those with uh, very good precision. And so we, need, we don't want to throw these uh, ions into our statistical analysis. That's just going to add noise. And this is what we end up with at the end of the day. Uh, essentially, this is the data, same data processed without the data reduction techniques I've just described. And here's the data after the data reduction. So obviously, there's a distinct difference there. So we've actually built this, uh, these data um, reduction algorithms into our uh, CIV software. This is our differential analysis software um, for doing both proteomics and metabolomics. And essentially, this software it has a unique uh, two-pass approach to uh, data reduction. First of all, it goes through the data files once, finding components. Then it goes back through the data to find where a component was the most intense. It will then describe that component, component on that sample, go back through the data to find any, uh, in a more targeted sense, to find any places where that component was missed. So this gets us around the kind of dynamic thresholding issue that I just described. So now on to the biological variants that we see. And as I said, we really need to just understand what that means um, and, and understand the, the, the things that vary under stimulus from things other than our drug under study. So here we're looking at fasting, uh, rat fasting, and we set up a study where we're looking at uh, uh, a time course um, over 16 hours of uh, a group of five rats fasting. Five controls, five rats followed it with a time course. Sample prep is pretty simple. Uh, so we take serum, protein precipitate that, uh, run it on the Q active at 70,000 resolution in both positive and negative iron, and uh, run under some pretty standard UP UHPLC conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. We are using uh, pooled quality controls in this data. Uh, this is a great way to keep tabs on the analytical performance of your system. And so what we do here is we take, a, uh, take an aliquot from each sample, make a pooled quality control. This is then injected. The same sample is injected at various points throughout the analysis, uh, essentially giving us um, a, a good tab on, on whether we can trust the, um, uh, the results from a, any given component or if we, we can really tease out whether we're looking at analytical or biological variability. So here's the results uh, from the uh, rat plasma data. And as you can see, the pool controls are grouping very nicely, tightly, right in the middle. That's exactly what we want to see. And then our samples are um, nicely separated from each other and have this nice uh, trajectory here from, from control out to 16 hours. So if we now take a look at some of the things that are responsible for those changes, uh, we can see that there are some things that trend up. And in this uh, representation, the dark blue is our control animals. So some things are trending up, some things are trending down. And you'll also notice that there's quite a bit of uh, variation from animal to animal. Now, we can feel fairly confident that this is actually due to uh, biological variability and not analytical variability. Because if we look at the, the uh, QCs that, again, have been injected interspersed amongst these, we can see we have very tight precision on these. But this, what we're, what we're measuring here, is actually biological variability. 
And just to give a, an idea of the overall robustness of the method itself, uh, this is a profile of uric acid uh, in both positive, positive and negative ion. Uh, and as you see, so our controls, there's very little uric acid, and then it quickly, quickly ramps up. But I think the nice thing here is that we've got the negative ion uh, corroborating the data that we got from the positive ion, and these, these profiles are almost identical. And the, uh, but the interesting thing is that there is about uh, 30 hours, a little over 30 hours difference in time between these uh, two sets of analyses. So the findings from this study uh, on, the, on the biological side is that the fasting does have a profound effect on the metabolomic profiles, uh, but most of these changes are modest in extent. But the fasting status may actually confuse a drug study or it may, it may exacerbate or obscure any drug-induced effects. And so we need to be aware of this. And having this data helps to put this kind of data into context when we do our drug studies. So in summary then, uh, we know that this is a very challenging field. It's fought with numerous sources of uh, noise. And the cost of going down that wrong path is high. I'm sure we've all spent countless hours tracing down false positives. And our instrumentation needs to be precise and robust. And I think the QExactive um, provides an ideal platform for this. The attributes are, um, uh, suit this kind of analysis perfectly. With chemical noise, the right software and the right controls can make all the difference. And as, we, as we've seen, some data reduction uh, processes can significantly reduce the noise in our systems. Biological noise, again, um, we just need to understand this. We need to uh, do systematic studies and understand uh, what we're looking at and make sure we don't confuse uh, these external factors with uh, what's happening when we dose our drugs. And one other thing that one can do in order to help minimize noise in the biological system um, is actually use metabolomic pre-screening to, to weed out um, any kind of biological outliers. This can be particularly important when the number of animals in your study is going to be small and you can't afford to lose any of those animals in your statistical analysis. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors uh, for all of their contributions to this work. I'd also like to thank Kate, Ying Ying, and Pat for giving us some early access uh, to the QExactive. I'd like to thank uh, the team in Bremen, uh, Germany, who developed uh, the QExactive instrument. And thank you all very much for your attention. Mark, are there any questions? There are two mics on two sides of the room. And I have a question to start with. Uh, can you comment on file size? How long does it take to process if a study is, let's say, 100 samples with the 70K resolution? Yeah, the, um, the file size is, is, is pretty large, um, but uh, probably about 250 uh, megabytes per data file. And the sample processing um, was taking about five minutes per, per sample. And so you can multiply that by the number in your study. But uh, the, these studies were all completed um, with overnight runs that were described here. That was about 50 samples. There's a question. Mark, yes. it's a very good presentation. I really like the, the, the use of removing the the adducts. When you think about maybe some of these markers potentially could be um, peptides, which could be multiply charged and may sort of manifest themselves in that similar kind of way. Do you, do you see there's any use in the software to be able to either combine those different um, samples such that you, you sort of remove any variation during a, a concentration drift um, during the metabolomic, metabolomic trying to study? Uh, yes, and actually, uh, that is something that the software is capable, capable of doing. Um, um, and the thought is that you could actually use this for proteomics um, differential analysis as well. That hasn't been fully tested because the, the software was actually developed for small molecule work. Um, and actually, right now, the software is essentially used to uh, find those cases where there are peptides and, and so forth and actually remove them from the data because typically they're not... Uh, and they're not of interest, but you could, software does actually group those multiple charge states together. Thank you.